everyone, and welcome back to More Than Amused podcast. I'm Stani. I'm Sadie, and welcome back. I realized I started that with my hands very energetically on my hips, so thank you Hello. for letting me be <laughs> a cheerleader today to welcome you to More Than Amused. For brief introduction, if you are new here, we are a podcast, obviously, and each week we talk about women in art, media, music, pop culture. We usually are talking about specific women. Every other week, we're either like focusing on one woman from history or we like talking about topics. Today's a topic episode to finish off mm -hmm. and round off our Women in Rock Month. It was a really fun month. We have three other episodes you can check out on Stevie mm -hmm. Nicks. We had a wonderful interview with an author who wrote a book about women in rock and yes. how that shaped feminism in the rock and punk scene. And then Sadie did an episode on Carol Kay last week, who's mm -hmm. like a bass guitarist that's practically on every song you've ever heard of. So Exactly. But cool you stuff. probably don't know her name. So <laughs> no. that's what we do here. Yeah. And then today we are just doing an overview. I mean, listen, these are all women who very much – not only do they, like, they deserve one episode, I'm sure there could be a whole podcast dedicated to their lives. Yes. We do this every <laughs> once in a while with people that it's like they're all within the same setting. And so yeah. it would feel a little redundant to do podcast episodes on each one of them. And mm -hmm. then they're also like so famous that it's like you have to shorten it or else you'd have to go longer. Kind of like our Dolly yeah. Parton episode. We were like, we can't really cover all of Dolly in one episode. So we had to shorten all of her life down into like brief snippets in order to as much as we could <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. we also did this with hollywood starlets if you're interested in that with marilyn monroe audrey hepburn grace kelly and doris day so yeah similar format to that we've done a couple of them and it just helps get like a quick overview of some of the biggest names in the space yeah and i guess <laughs> like you showing or you telling all of those names we've done, I think also gives a good overview on just how varied these topics can be. But we yes. always go back to women and we always go back to women in the arts and feminism and all that. So yes. there's more than a muse for you to our if you're new here. Yeah. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, all the episodes that are on there are not all the episodes we have. We are nearing 200 episodes. I we've think we're in like 180 this. yeah ish. <laughs> yeah. We've been doing this for this is our third year. Yeah, which is crazy. It is crazy. Long time. So on we just three. really started <laughs> filming on YouTube, but if you want to go back on any podcasting platform, we've got a giant backlog <laughs> for you mm -hmm. to check out on everything. And, and if you've been listening the whole time, congratulations. You can now watch us on yes. YouTube and you're gonna see every week our setup's gonna get a little bit more zhuzhed up <laughs> some limitations here if you don't know sadie and i both work full time we're also Correct. in two different time zones so recording is a hassle and we obviously don't have studio setups because i'm a full-time graphic designer you're like a music teacher slash singer songwriter and yep. so mm -hmm. we're just doing the best we can and therefore we are in really dark rooms right now because it is nighttime it we, we always yeah. record at nighttime Unless like it's on a Saturday on and we get lucky. Yeah. True. No, it's a little hot. I'm not going to lie, but <laughs> it's okay. I didn't ever think I'd try and become a YouTuber. Here we are. I mean, we did originally do this because we were like, podcast, easy, sit down, conversation, don't even have to worry about being on camera. Yep. Now that's changed. Here but it's now. okay. We're here. Yeah, now I have to happy remember to, to, we are so happy to be here. And honestly, I am happy to be here. I do mean that genuinely because the more people that can find out and learn more about the women we're covering, the happier I will be. That's all Agreed. That, that is our whole purpose. So Love exactly. It. To start off our episode, before we dive into our topic, did you create any art this week or did you consume any art this week that you were excited about? Or I don't know, anything just from the week stick out to you? Of course, I created art, but it was all very commercial. So I did some beautiful ads. Nice. <laughs> they actually turned out really good. I'm very proud of them, but nothing to write home about. <laughs> but as for consuming art, I watched a really weird show. Have you heard Whoa. of Neon Demons or The Neon Demon? I no. think. No. Okay. I have it not. came out in 2016 and it is starring Elle Fanning and it has oh, a bunch of other people. Okay. Keon Keanu Reeves, all sorts of stuff. It's about it's about the modeling industry, but it's definitely like a horror film. 
Whoa. It's interesting. I feel like, those I feel are like really it has big names for me not to have heard of it. It's rated pretty well. It got six out of 10. Okay. But I don't think it's a movie that people like understand, if that makes sense. And I don't mean that in a pretentious mm. way. I mean that, like, I Googled, yeah. what does this mean <laughs> after I watched it? <laughs> got it. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> but I, from what I gathered, it's about like, the toxic implications of the beauty industry and like how everyone's always looking for the new best thing, like the youngest, the prettiest Mm -hmm. constantly Mm -hmm. and like that competitive field and what that can do to a person. But then of course that has like a horror mythological twist where there's like vampires involved. Anyway. I wasn't expecting you to say vampires. So that is very exciting. But the visuals are absolutely stunning. They do some really cool stuff with like makeup and light and everything. And Elle Fanning's just incredible, right? Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting. And then I also watched Talk to Me because a bunch of people were talking about that one. Oh, was that the? Yes. (gasps) That movie is. I did see that movie. (laughs) Scary movie. It took me three times to get through it. I had to pause That's and fair. wait a second mm-hmm. and go back. Yeah. And I was like, this is too much. I usually don't do shows like that, but everyone was talking about like how incredible it was. And so I was like, okay, fine. And I made it through, it, but gosh. It is very good. I was the person, because we went in theaters and I don't usually go to scary movies in theaters for yeah. that reason. I'm a baby when it comes to scary movies, but I definitely was like, underneath my jacket for a moment googling does it end happy because i no. needed to know i mainly needed to know if a certain character died or not i'm not gonna spoil oh. it at this point but once i got my answer i felt okay with proceeding and just continuing to watch but that movie freaked me out yeah that was definitely one of the scariest ones i've seen in a while so mm-hmm. <laughs> it took yeah. me a minute and then i was like i don't like horror movies why did i watch this and then i realized because i've been watching a lot of like feminist horror movies and those ones aren't scary mm-hmm. so i forgot mm-hmm. how freakish like horror can actually be anyway that's but, fair yeah that's what i've been up to trying to gear up for a really cool episode we've got coming so i've been consuming go. a lot of content what about you anything you consumed created I am not going to lie. This last week, I have just been really dialed into my Bravo reality TV. Um, Love it. Vanderpump Rules. I'm going to consider that an art form. Actually, yeah, I feel like I would be so interested in doing an episode on reality TV. I feel like or it's like- performance art, isn't it? I would think so. Absolutely. I assume. Like, I think there's a lot of correlations you could do there we should do an episode on reality tv (laughs) and real housewives of salt lake city now i feel like i have to watch that stuff because i don't live in utah anymore any connection i'll take it oh i heard the drama i don't watch it Mm -hmm. but i heard the drama of this week it it was it was dramatic i also ooh, i went and i saw the mean girls movie oh how did you feel about it i've heard a lot of mixed reactions I really enjoyed the movie actually while I was sitting there and watching it. I thought it was really funny. Mm-hmm. Laughed a lot. I love Renee Rapp. I think she is incredible. Yeah. And so I, I love loved it. Too. Went with a friend of mine who was also a musician and right after the movie, we both stood up and was like, who was in charge of the music there? I don't oh. like talking badly about things, but there were certain performances that I felt were very lackluster and yeah. didn't really do it for me. I heard that um, like Katie was disappointing to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. And I don't like speaking badly about artists, but I just feel like her musical number, I almost, I don't even think it was her fault. I'm just like, who produced this? Like, where is the pizzazz? Who decided to make this a one note thing because it's not giving what it needs to be giving and it was uncomfortable. I've seen some comparisons to like the Broadway musical track and I understand where the criticism is coming from. I also mm-hmm. heard someone explain that the movie is not able to stand on its own without the original Mean Girls, and that kind of makes yes. a big difference. Whereas, like other ones, like Les Mis, you don't have to watch the original Broadway show in order to watch the movie to get it. But this yeah. one, you'd have to watch the original Mean Girls movie in order to get to this get movie. That's so fair. And honestly, watching that just made me want to watch the original Mean Girls. And then I did a couple days later. So it was fun and it was nostalgic, but does it need to be here? I don't know. And like, it's a huge musical. Fair that it got a movie. That's the way it goes. So I'm here for it. 
it was fun but every criticism i hear i'm like mm, valid and that's okay so, yeah exactly sometimes though you can just go to the movie just to have fun and i had a lot of fun watching that movie so oh, that's awesome i'm excited really i don't go to movie theaters really but the minute it's out on streaming i'll probably rent it the last one i went to was barbie and i saw it three times in theaters and then nice. <laughs> speaking uh, of barbie i've yeah. been seeing so many mixed reactions to like the nominations mm -hmm. i have to say like i didn't really expect marco robbie to get nominated even though she was phenomenal i didn't but i expected greta gerwig yes i'm with you on that I'm yeah. also, I am so not mad about Ryan Gosling. And like, I get no. people saying, oh, a movie about Barbie and the th thing that people loved the most was Ken. I'm sorry. I walked out of that movie being the most excited about Ken. And His maybe that's on me. was incredible. And I think America Ferrera, very deserving. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot of minority women nominated this time. And I think that's amazing. Lily Gladstone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. If that woman doesn't win an Oscar for that, I will be so mad. That yeah. movie was incredible. She was with some of the best actors ever, I dare say. I feel like people can say, like, Leonardo DiCaprio, think what you want about him. He's a great actor. And, like, mm -hmm. I felt like she stole every scene that she was in with him. She was yeah. so good. So, yeah, That's like, I'm definitely the Oscars. on that team. But I did see a thing that it was, like, someone posted all the people nominated for Best Director. And they mm -hmm. were like, but who would Greta replace? Who would you take off of it? And someone literally responded and said, any of them. And they were like, yeah. she could have directed any of those films and done phenomenal, but oh. none of them could have directed Barbie. And I was like, That's that is such fair. a good point. Like, she could have directed any of those films and done good, but none of them could have directed. Can you imagine Christopher Nolan trying to direct Barbie? I'm sorry, but that's just laughable. Uh, uh, and I'm not a Christopher Nolan fan, so I'm going to kick him off the roster and put Greta in his place. I don't. <laughs> Did you see Oppenheimer? No. <laughs> that's fair. It was long and sad. So yeah. I get it. But it was, it was a good movie. And but. they like they removed a lot of the women that were actually involved in the Manhattan Project. And so I was just like, why? Like, that's so yeah. messed up. Yeah. So I just decided to true. avoid it altogether. But I heard mixed things. I can respect people that. People loved it. Yeah. It was good when I watched it, but it was, I don't like long movies. So that's yeah, how I felt about fair. the flowers over Osage County. Osage, mm -hmm. no. The flowers oh, of the Killers Killer Moon. Of the fl flowers of the Killer Moon, yes. Is, yeah. it was so good. I loved Killers it. Killers of the Flower I don't Moon? think I'll ever watch it again. Yeah, Killers of the Flower Moon. Okay. Maybe like, I'm wait. not, maybe they should have. It's not the moon different. that's killer. Killers it's of the Flower the Moon. Flower Moon, okay. <laughs> yeah, not Flowers of the Killer Moon. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gosh. Although, speaking Anyways. of that, we do have an episode about the ballerinas from that yes. tribe mm -hmm. from November. Maria Talchi. So Look at everything tribe. connects, guys. We have it episodes does. for so many aspects of culture. Go check it out. <laughs> we could do this every week. I swear, every time something comes out in the news, I'm like, oh, that connects to this. We have an episode or like any new episode we do. It's And don't forget all these other ones that we've done that connect. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anyways, it's a constant ongoing string and that's pretty cool. I think so too. Should we dive into what we're talking about today? Yes, we so should. We have been jokingly calling this the Pats and Joes mm -hmm. episode <laughs> because we're talking about Janice Joplin, Pat Benatar, Joan Jett, and Patti Smith. And it's just funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Pats and the Joes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So some of the biggest names in rock definitely names mm -hmm. that i all rec that i recognize immediately so yeah we're each going to just switch off do a brief overview on their lives their biggest accomplishments their legacies it, they all have incredible legacies and lived incredible lives so and they I'm have excited. long legacies most of oh, them i think both of mine yes. were still alive were yours too except for janice joplin okay that's what i thought but the rest yeah. of them are so i was like they're still going some of them like mm -hmm. they're still performing so yeah they are not nearing the end here it's just a celebration of the impact that they've had so far maybe i'll start with janice joplin then is that cool let's yeah let's do it janice joplin had a four year career total i think i oh my gosh i am only gonna be scratching the surface and also 
tragically, she died young, 27. Mm -hmm. I'm 26. So just thinking about the fact that her musical output at this point, like she'd reached that already in her life, like at my same age. It's incredible. And so tragic, though, when people do die young. And there was a lot about her that kind of focused on her relapsing and her Mm -hmm. struggles with addiction. And like, when she did relapse and had struggles with that. And I honestly didn't really feel like talking about that. I feel like if you're familiar with Janis Joplin, she's a part of the famed 27 Club of just Mm. a bunch of other late artists and musicians who just all Mm. happened to die at the age of 27. But even still, like in that short career, she's left such an incredible mark on rock and roll and music. She's considered one of the greats. And forgive me if the my overview is a little PC, but like I said, I didn't really want to touch on the tragedy as much. And there's also a lot of drama that happened after with people writing books about her that were in relationships with her, that people had a lot of thoughts on. And again, I just didn't really feel like talking about it. And mainly because if I really dived into everything this could have been a whole episode, Janis Joplin. Yeah. Can I ask like what the motivation behind them writing the books? Was it just trying to get their minute in the sun of I dated this legend? Or I feel like that is almost the controversy about it because it was a woman named Peggy, like Sassiter, I think that's how you would say it, called Going okay. Down with Janis. And it, it had a lot of attention. And yeah, I guess I don't really necessarily know what her appeal was it. I don't know if it was hopefully to respect it or I mean respect her and tell more people about her but also apparently they were like I don't know like it was graphic about like their life together like sexually mm-hmm. and I just personally feel like if someone has passed on and they don't really have the ability to like give their stamp of approval that they're comfortable with that being shared with the world I just feel like you shouldn't do that but yeah I don't know That's maybe fair. people who know more about the situation would have a different opinion but yeah. I feel like another thing too is like waiting. Yeah. I think like Matthew Perry, he didn't write his book about being in Friends until sadly he passed away shortly after, but literally like mm-hmm. years and years after. And I think sometimes it takes distance in order to view things clearly. So it's yeah. interesting that it sounds like this that came out really quickly. Yeah. Like she passed away in the 70s and this book came out in 73. Yeah. So See, that's too fast. I have, I have a like little more... Fast patience <laughs> just seem to be yeah like yeah. it seemed to be something to try and get attention for somewhere okay so let's just talk about janice so janice lynn joplin was born january 19th of 1943 obviously was an american singer and songwriter and was one of the most successful widely known rock performers of her era she was noted for her like unique vocal sound and her electric stage presence rose to prominence following an appearance at the monterey pop festival where she was the lead singer of the little known San Francisco psychedelic rock band Big Brother and The Holding Company. And that's actually something I did not actually necessarily know about Janis Joplin is that her music was largely released with this band. I didn't know that either. Yeah, and I'll go into that a little bit more later. But she released two full two two albums with the band. Then she left them to continue as a solo artist with her own different backing groups called the Cosmic Blue Bands and then the Full Tilt Boogie Band. She appeared at the famous 1969 Woodstock Festival and on the Festival Express train tour. Five singles of hers reached the U.S. Billboard Hot 100, which including a cover of Chris Christopherson's Me and Bobby McGee, which posthumously reached number one in March of 1971. And then her most popular songs include her cover versions of Peace of My Heart, Cry Baby Down on Me, Ball with Chain, Summertime, and her original song Mercedes Benz, which was her final recording. So, so as for her early life, she was born in Port Arthur, Texas. Her parents' names were Dorothy Bonita East, and her dad was Seth Ward Joplin, who was an engineer. She, growing up, felt very ostracized, bullied in high school. As a teen, she became overweight and suffered from acne that left her, like, with deep scars. Mm -hmm. Apparently, like, kids at high school routinely just taunt her, call her names, like, pig and freak, creep. She's once said, I was a misfit. I read, I painted, and I thought. And also, like, people would, like, make fun of her. I don't know if it's because she, like, was friends with black people. But they called her a very profane name that I'm not going to say. Yeah. Um, I was like, where does that come from? That's mm -hmm. horrible. Yeah. 
Tits um, are awful. Truly awful. <laughs> But she graduated from high school in 1960 and attended Lamar State College of Technology in Beaumont, Texas, and then later went to the University of Texas, which was UT, but she didn't complete or graduate. But I, th- I love this little quote from it, that there was a campus newspaper called The Daily Texan. They actually ran a profile on her in their July 27th, 1962 issue, headlining, She Dares to be Different. And the article starts, she goes barefooted when she feels like it, wears Levi's to class because they're more comfortable and carries who, her auto harp with her everywhere she goes so that in case she gets the urge to break into song, it will be handy. Her name is Janice Joplin. Oh, wait, were you not allowed to wear jeans to class? That's what I was also wondering. I'm like, wow. What did they wear? Jeans. <laughs> Skirts? I'm, like, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, I slacks? guess it was the 1960s, but. Yeah, it was the 62. Wow. Um, they would be shocked by today's students. Most of them weren't the even sweats. jeans. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was going to say. I'm like, I saw a kid go once in his pajamas. <laughs> and same. So she left Texas in January 1963 to just get away. She said her head was in a different place, and she actually hitchhiked with her friend Chet Helms to San Francisco. So all the way from Texas to San Francisco. And then while she was in there, she met, just made friends. One was the future guitarist of Jefferson Airplane, and they started recording But while she was in San Francisco is when she started getting involved in using drugs. Mm -hmm. And there was actually, she was there for a couple of years. And then in 65, her friends really started like noticing the fact that she was not doing well. And they persuaded her to return to Texas. Apparently during May of that year, her friends threw together a bus fare party so she could return Mm -hmm. to her parents in Texas because it was just very clear that she wasn't doing well. So she returned home. She was she had lost a lot of weight, just like clearly wasn't doing well, but she tra- she changed her lifestyle and avoided drugs and alcohol. She enrolled back into school at Lamar University, enrolled at to major in anthropology, but she still was playing music. She would go to Austin to sing solo and accompany herself on guitar. Something that I thought was really interesting is that there was a like a psychiatrist or a psychologist that she would go see. And she had apparently really struggled and like was just Frustrated by she didn't feel like she could pursue a professional career as a singer without relapsing into drugs. Interesting. And also she was very scared of her drug-related memories. And so that was a fear. And that psychologist tried to reassure her that she didn't have to use drugs to succeed in music. But yeah, I think that was something that was a fear that she felt like if she pursued it, she... I just think that so many people in the music business were just also... She knew she would be around that she knew she'd be around that. But I guess she said that she also said that if she were to avoid singing professionally, she would have to become a key punch operator as she had done a few years early or a secretary and then a wife and mother. And she would have to become similar to all the other women in Port Arthur. So I feel like mm. that's what she was trying to avoid though. I don't think yeah, she wanted Yeah, she that. wanted so hard to be different, but it was leading to her kind of getting involved in things that... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that she shouldn't be involved in. I was going to say, we talked about Stevie Nicks and her Mm -hmm. longstanding addiction and how it was just so common in the music scene at the time that there wasn't really a way for her to avoid it until she checked herself into rehab. Mm -hmm. Of course, it seems like it was really rampant at the time, and I don't think people understood how bad everything was yet because there is a major difference between marijuana and cocaine. And also, she was like using heroin too, which is... yeah intense but she does get the attention still of the big brother and holding company because of her unique vocal style and it was a san francisco based psychedelic rock band and they had gained some traction of their own and her old friend from san francisco who was now a promoter and was managing them it was actually the same friend that she hitchhiked from texas to san francisco with reached out to her and was and recruited her to join this. So he sent his friend named Travis Rivers to find her in Austin, Texas, so that she could come out. Aware of the fact that she did have a previous drug addiction, they had a face-to-face conversation with the parents, and he drove her from Austin to Port Arthur so that she could have that talk with them, and then began that long drive to San Francisco. Apparently, though, she gave her parents the impression that she was just going to Austin, and then... But then actually, like, months later, she, like, sent them a postcard or something or a letter from San Francisco. And that's when they actually learned that she went all the way there. But that's okay. (laughs) But the band's debut studio album was released in August of 1967. And then shortly after the group's breakthrough appearance was in June at this Monterey Pop Festival. 
And what I thought was interesting is that they actually got a different record label. And when they put out their singles, they actually put the Big Brother and the Holding Company band featuring Janis Joplin. So I think that the record hmm. labels had a sense of who was the big star power here. And they really wanted to focus on Janis Joplin. Sometime in 1968, the band's billing just changed to Janis Joplin and the Big Brother and the Holding Company. And most <laughs> of the media coverage was going on to her. And as I'm sure we can imagine, that created some resentment within the band. Um, the other members thought that Joplin was on a star trip, while others were telling Joplin that Big, Br Big Brother was a terrible band and that she ought to just dump them. So I think that some people were pissed and others were saying, get out of there. You're better than that. Mm -hmm. Time Magazine, though, called Joplin probably the most powerful singer to emerge from the white rock mute movement, which is a whole other topic we could dive into of where rock music really comes from. And then Richard Goldstein wrote for the May 1968 issue of Vogue that Joplin was, quote, the most staggering leading woman in rock. She slinks like tar, scowls like war, clutching the knees of a final stanza, begging it not to leave. Janis Joplin can sing the chic off any listener. Big nice. deal. Yeah. Um, the album Cheap Thrills is what launched the group and i mean her to stardom it reached number one on billboard and was at the top for eight weeks after its release the album was certified gold at release and sold over a million copies in the first month of its release and then she continued to play with them i believe her last performance though was just two years later in 1970 but there was a lot of like moments where Oh, like the band wouldn't, she would say, this is my last performance. Or they would like bill, the promoter would be like, come see Janis Joplin in her last performance with the band. But then she kept performing with them. But after 1970, she did not, she didn't play with them. But her drug problem is just like continuously bad mm. throughout this point. She does, starts recording a new album with a new backing band that she had. But then in 1969, she appears at Woodstock, which I mean, Woodstock. She yeah, actually went at 2 a.m. Yeah, I know. It's so cool. Um, oh, to have been there. Um, I know, also right? Wild. I'd probably be she, terrified, but it would be cool. <laughs> yeah, I would say, wow, I'd love to be there. But admittedly, that is not my scene. I don't go to the Woodstocks of nowadays. But she appeared at Woodstock at 2 a.m. on Sunday, August 17th. What's so funny about it is I guess she just told her band that they would be performing at the concert as just, oh yeah, just another gig that we're doing. But then when they were flown by helicopter over the festival site to the stage, she saw the enormous crowd and I think realized exactly what this was. I don't um, think I've ever looked it up, but there was only like one Woodstock, right? Oh like it was God. like the one performance and that was it. Not like Coachella, right? No, actually they did a Woodstock 2 like years later. I don't think oh, that, okay. like they did one in 1969 and then I think that they like did another one in the 90s or like two other oh, ones okay. in the 90s. But that's but, like kind of it. Yeah, you're right. It's not like yeah. it was like a yearly thing in the 60s. Oh, okay, cool. Because like when everyone talks about Woodstock, they're talking about the 1969 one. Yeah, they're talking about that exact same show. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's like such a big deal and so iconic for certain artists to have been featured on mm -hmm. her because it only happened once, but yet it's still the big deal. She obviously was very eager to get on stage, but there were a lot of delays during the night. Apparently, like certain people were contractually obliged to perform ahead of her. I don't know if she was supposed to be one of the last ones of the evening. Mm. So she had 10 hours before she arrived. And then when she actually played, a lot of drug use was happening in those 10 hours. Um, so apparently the performance is maybe like, unfortunately, the beginning of the end where people were noticing that she was not doing as well quote from someone who had witnessed her perform she had been amazing at monterey but tonight she wasn't at her best due probably to the long delay and probably too to the amount of booze and heroin she'd consumed while she waited but even janice on an off night was incredible february of the following year 1970 she actually traveled to brazil where she stopped her drug and alcohol use she was there with a friend and then she actually met someone while she was there and fell in love she returned to the u.s again and though i think just like being back in the same environment she just fell into old mm -hmm. patterns again and um that relationship i know from brazil fizzled out it didn't do well 
I think because again of her addiction, but her last public performance was with her band at the time, the Full Tilt Boogie Band that took place at August 12, 1970 at the Harvard Stadium in Boston. And apparently it went well. But then October 1st of 1970, she completed her very last recording called Mercedes Benz. And it was recorded in one single take on Saturday, October 3rd. Third, she visited the Sunset Sound recorders to listen to the instrumental track for a song, Buried Alive in the Blues, which the band had recorded earlier that day. And she and Paul Rothschild agreed that she would record the vocal the following day. That night is when she passed away. And she was like staying at a hotel that I think the hotel had a reputation for being one where there was a lot of drug use happening there. And yeah, she unfortunately died. Her death at the age of 27, like I mentioned, of course, stunned fans and shocked the music world. I think especially because there was the death of Can't Eat singer Alan Wilson that happened a month earlier. And then Jimi Hendrix died just 16 days earlier. And they were both aged at the age of 27, which I think people are like, that's just so crazy to happen twice. That's when people yeah, kind of start. Yeah, the 27 like club. The, yeah, that's where that kind of comes from. And then all three of those musicians performed at the Monterey Pop Festival and then at Woodstock. So I think, again, that gotcha. just like added to it. Some nice things, though, about her is that music historian wrote that Joplin had a devastatingly original voice. And then another New York journalist from the New York Times wrote that Joplin as an artist was overpowering and deeply vulnerable. Another quote is that Joplin was the female version of Elvis Presley in her ability to captivate an audience. A second solo album, Pearl, was released in January of 1971, just three months after her death. It reached number one on the Billboard charts and she was post- Humously inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1995. Rolling Stone has ranked Joplin number 46 on its 2004 list of the 100 greatest artists of all time, number 28 on its 2008 list of the 100 greatest singers of all time. NPR dubbed Joplin as the Queen of Rock and named her one of the 50 greatest voices. And she remains one of the top selling musicians in the United States with Recording Industry Association with the Recording Industry Association of America certifications of 18.5. 5 million albums sold, which is man a lot of albums sold. Yeah, that's a lot. It's crazy. So. Like, you said this, but, like, it's insane how big of a career she had in such a short time. It's really Yeah, impressive. this all happened in four years. And yeah. it's so tragic. And I think there's just so much – I'm sure it's because of the people that like released books about her that they know so much about her. Mm. But, yeah, there's just so much on Janis Joplin. And, it's again, it's so sad – yeah, it's just a tragedy, but yeah, if you definitely. haven't listened to her music, I haven't listened to her in a long time. So it was fun to mm -hmm. go back to that because she's awesome and she deserves everything. So there we I go. I agree. There's Janice. Love it. We'll move right into Joan Jett. Slightly happier story. She's still going. So Okay, good. I know. Same with like <laughs> yeah. my few when I'm like, okay, I guess we're starting with the sad one to, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Hopefully they'll move forward. Less sad. Okay, so Joan Jett is, of course, an American rock singer, guitarist, songwriter, record producer, and an actress. She's done a lot. And she's best known for her work as the front woman of her band Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. But she mm -hmm. also founded and performed with the Runaways, who released the hit song Cherry Bomb which we've mm -hmm. talked about so many times <laughs> with our Riot Girl episode and everything. And I will be talking a lot more about Riot Girl as we continue this. She's also known for her rendition of the song I Love Rock and Roll, which hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 for seven weeks in 1982. And then her other songs include Bad Reputation, Light of Day, I Hate Myself for Loving You, her covers of Crimson and Clover, Do You Want to Touch Me, and Dirty Deeds. She's got some really big I name songs, songs out there <laughs> yes. yeah I was a little shocked to learn that I love rock and roll was a cover because I was, I was just like, going what? to say that wait I actually have just found yeah I'm finding that out in this moment I did not realize that yes she originally heard it like super super early in her career when she was touring in Europe and I guess uh -huh. it stuck with her because she ended up recording a cover of it years and years later and that's what ended okay, up being cool. like the super big hit so mm -hmm. yeah it's not 
her original song, but she has so many Amazing. others. <laughs> she was born Joan Marie Larkin on September 22nd, 1958 in Pennsylvania. She was the oldest of three children and her father was an insurance salesman and her mother was a secretary. Very normal little mm-hmm. life. They were Protestant, so they went to church in Sunday school, but they weren't really like strict in it. And then her family ended up moving to Maryland where she went to junior high and high school. She was, of course, very musical very early on. So many of the people we talk about. Mm -hmm. She got her first guitar when she was only 13 and took guitar lessons. But I thought this was funny. She ended up quitting because the instructor kept trying to teach her folk songs. And she was not interested in learning folk. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Yeah. Her family shortly after that moved to California and Los Angeles County, which of course provided her with the opportunity to pursue music. Shortly after the move, her parents did divorce and she changed her name to Joan Jett. And there's like a lie here that I thought was funny. She would tell people that Jett was her mother's maiden name. Oh, (laughs) it wasn't. She just thought it sounded more like a rock star name than her birth name. Which, I mean, mean, Joan Jett or Joan Larkin, she has a point. Joan Jett's a great name. Yeah. It is. So it worked out really well for her. But yeah, that's what she would tell people. And it was false. At only age 16, she was a founding member of the Runaways, which is insane to me, like how young they were. Um, Mm -hmm. The other founding member was the drummer, Sandy West. And they shared, like, lead vocal parts. Mainly Sandy, I think, was the lead vocalist. But they shared some lead vocals. They played, she played rhythm guitar, and she wrote or co-wrote some of the band's material along with Ford West and Curie, the other members. And they ended up recording three albums together with that lineup. They were really popular overseas, but they didn't have the same level of success in the United States. Apparently, they have a huge cult following in Japan, which I thought was super oh, interesting. That's cool. But yeah, they were like really popular in Europe, Asia, Australia, Canada, and South America. But they just but couldn't get it in the United States. Yeah. They ended up losing a member of the band, Curie. They released two more albums with Jet handling the lead vocals, and then they produced five albums together before they disbanded in 1979. Fun fact, didn't know this. (laughs) In 2010, The Runaways, a movie about Jet's band, was released, and it stars Kristen Stewart as Jet and Dakota Fanning as Curie, and she was actually a producer for the film. I did not know that movie existed. Amazing. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I had no clue, and I think it's cool that she produced it as well. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> there's some kind of like funny things here jet has for years like refused to either confirm or deny that she's lesbian or bisexual like she just won't say okay in 1994 she actually had an interview where she was like i'm not saying no i'm not saying yes i'm saying believe what you bo- want assume away go ahead and then in 2006 an interviewer asked her when she had come out as lesbian and she said I never made any statement about my personal life of any level. I never made any proclamations, so I don't know where people are getting that from. And in 2016, the former Runaways guitarist, Lita Ford, revealed in her memoir that she temporarily quit the band because she found out all of the other members were gay. Oh my gosh, she asked her. (laughs) I'm laughing. I mean, what the heck? Yeah. I'm like, okay, just look like a homophobe, why don't you, in your memoir. But anyway, (laughs) she found out that Sandy, who she had bonded with the most, was a lesbian. Then she found out that Cherie was messing around with Joan. And so she freaked out and quit the band because she didn't know how to take it. And it's okay. I don't know. I'm like, she came around. You know what? Maybe she came back. Yeah. But still very strange and then of course in 2018 the new york times asked about it again because there was this lgbt film festival and they didn't want to show her documentary because she wasn't out oh interesting yeah and which is antiquated ideas now like i feel like now you just be like oh she's queer like it doesn't really Mm -hmm. matter and to that, she responded, they don't want the movie there because I don't declare. And then she held up this necklace and was like, what the bleep is that? And it had, I'm not entirely sure what it was. I'll have to look it up. But it was like two women symbols crossing each other. 
And she was like, it's not been off since I got it. And I wear this one every day. And she like turned around and lifted her shirt. And she had like similar symbols on her lower back. And then she said, I don't know how much more you can declare. So she hasn't officially stated what she is. I don't Mm. think she needs to. She's obviously like part of the LGBT Q community and I think that's enough. Mm-hmm. I think good for there's her. like we see it a lot in like modern pop culture of just people I'm thinking like Billie Eilish put a label on themselves. Yeah, exactly. And where it's I don't I think we've talked about it like mm-hmm. queer beating baiting isn't a thing, it's a real person because people are always gonna be yeah defining things and figuring that out for themselves. So And people are so dimensional and some people have a really hard time with labels and I don't think it's necessary to force everyone to do that like people can live how they want to mm-hmm. live <laughs> but I don't feel like it's fair for yeah. either community or like group of people to do or say anything about it and be offended that someone's not willing to like define themselves and especially if so. you're famous you might say something one year and years later you're like oh wait no but do I want to publicly tell everyone something's you know I feel yeah. differently. that'd be hard that's so true it's and an intimate, also think of like how much things how much things have changed too over the years from like Mm -hmm. the 70s until now about like homosexuality and like queerness and everything that's a big difference like it was probably terrifying to her early on in her career to even yeah it meant a lot entertain the idea one other thing i did want to bring up because i feel like it's important to talk about but i don't want to get too much into it one of her runaway band members Jackie Fox of the Runaways, she had mm-hmm. allegations against Kim Foley, who was this American record producer, songwriter, and musician, and he had managed mm. the Runaways. And she had this allegation that he assaulted her, sexually assaulted her, on New Year's Eve. She said she was 16 years old and then said that all of her band members were watching like staring at her oh. while he raped her but like they have said that there's no way like jet later said that anyone who knows me understands that if i was aware of a friend of a bandmate being violated i would not stand by while it happened and she said for a group of young teenagers thrust into 70s rock stardom there were relationships that were bizarre but i was not aware of this incident obviously jackie's story is extremely upsetting and then although we haven't spoken in decades i wish her peace and healing So I'm not entirely sure, (laughs) but I felt like it was important to mention Mm. that like that incident happened and it would have been like a really, like it was their manager and they were 16. That's really messed up. So yeah, Mm. scary situation, I think, for teenagers to be in. But yeah, that was the whole Runaways situation. And then while working for the Runaways, she met this producer and songwriter, Kenny Laguna. They ended up like hitting it really off. And they wrote together for a while. They released an independent album using his daughter's college savings, which I hope they made enough money back to send her to college. (laughs) Yeah. Because, yeah, they did that. But they couldn't get any record labels to pick them up. And so they just printed them and would sell them out of the back of his car. And... Oh my! Yeah, and it was doing well, but they didn't have any advance money. And so he actually told her, like, forget the band, support yourself on the advance money. There's enough for you, but there's not enough for a band. And Mm -hmm. she turned him and she was like, we have to have a band. And so they formed the Black Hearts. And he said, and I believe to this day that it was the Black Hearts, that concept, that made Joan Jett. There we go. She trusted her instincts. Yeah, it's what she's most famous for. It worked. She placed an ad in LA Weekly saying that she was looking for three good men. <laughs> and those are the three people she formed a band with. There, It's actually funny. The bass player, his name was Gary Ryan. And that was actually just his stage name because he joined the Black Hearts when he was only 15. And he was trying to cover up his age. Wow. That's so Yeah, wild. I don't think they knew how old he was, but. No. He did it anyway. (laughs) The 70s, man. (laughs) Truly. But yeah, they continued to use their personal savings. They had their own system of distribution and would sell albums out of the back of the car after every concert. And eventually he was unable to keep up with the demand for the album. Like they were selling too many and they couldn't print enough, which is a good place to be in. (laughs) Yeah. So eventually one of his old friends, who is the founder of Casablanca Records, ended up signing Jet to his new label, Boardwalk Records. And they re-released the album as Bad Reputation and it came out. Uh, 
Excellent. Yes. And then it took off. They said the spring 1981 concert in New York City proved to be a turning point. Described by music journalist is a career defining performance by Jet. It helped solidify a strong New York City following for Joan Jet and the Black Hearts. And after their year of touring and recording, they sent a new album out into the world entitled I Love Rock and Roll. Amazing. And yep. Yeah, that was insane because it, that song, of course, <laughs> immediately Huge. was the first single on the album and was number one on the Billboard Hot 100 for seven weeks in a row. It's a Billboard number one's 56th song of all time. And the wow. song has also been inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. That is cool. Which I didn't realize they induct songs into the Grammy Hall of Fame, but that makes sense. I I feel like it's, yeah, if they didn't win the Grammy when they were eligible to win the Grammy, but it's like they've obviously had such an obvious impact on the world of music. It's like they'll give it its flowers eventually. Right? It's like we've got to get it in there. Somehow it deserves a Grammy. Yeah. But – Obviously, it just took off like crazy from there. They released two more albums. They were getting top 40 hits constantly. They went on sellout tours with The Police, Queen, and Aerosmith. Just small names. Yeah, who's that? Whatever. And she actually was one of the first English-speaking rock acts to perform in Panama and the Dominican Republic. And Mm -hmm. I thought this was so interesting. Apparently, her visit to Panama sparked a riot. And then the military leader asked her if she wanted to spend the night with him at the presidential palace. And I'm guessing not in the come here and you'll be safe kind of way. Yeah, I think that's a fair assumption yeah. to make. I did not hear if she took him up on it, but I'm assuming probably but no. Yeah, I'm... Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. I'm assuming the same, yes. Mm-hmm. She also got an MTV New Year's Eve special. She was in the movie Light of Day that... Bruce Springsteen wrote a song for specifically for the film, and the performance was critically acclaimed. She ended up doing a lot of acting. I'm not going to get into all of those roles because there was a lot, but she did quite a bit of acting for a rock singer, which surprised me. I didn't know that either. She also went back to producing and worked primarily with two bands, Circus Lupus and Bikini Kill. Hey, that's so cool. Yes, because... As we've talked about in previous episodes, the Riot Girl movement started in the 1990s, and mm-hmm. Bikini Kill was a huge part of that, and many yep. of the women credited Jet as a role model and inspiration. They have even have called her the original Riot Girl at times. Ah, uh, that's awesome. Love that. Like everyone else we're talking about, she's also been described as the queen of rock and roll. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so many queens, but that's okay. We can share the I crown. know. Yes, of course. I They wrote a lot about her guitar, and it's because Gibson released a special one. So I'll tell a little bit oh, about cool. it. Her signature guitar was a white Gibson Melody Maker. She actually, it was her second guitar. Her first one was a blonde Le Paul. And she said, it's beautiful. I still have it, but it's too heavy. She would jump and run around a lot on stage, and it was getting to her shoulder. And so she started looking for a lighter one. And she heard from the road crew that Eric Carmen from the Raspberry Raspberries was selling a Melody Maker. And so she ended up buying his guitar. And it was the mm. guitar that he that played Go All the Way and all the Raspberry hits. And then she said, and then I played on it. I love rock and roll, Crimson and Clover. Do you want to touch me in Bad Reputation? And then she said she got too scared to take it on the road with her anymore because she was so nervous that someone was going to steal it or break it. Mm -hmm. She said, it's so beautiful. It's white. It has no stickers on it. There are cracks in the paint and yellowing from age or club cigarettes. It's an unbelievable looking guitar. I have it in a closet and I take it out occasionally to record, but I don't even need to use it to record anymore because I have a guitar that sounds pretty much like it. I'm actually afraid to bring out the original. (laughs) It's got a great heritage. It's got, it's a guitar full of hits. I so would know that. what that guitar would sell for. That is, <laughs> pr- that's precious. <laughs> yep. She's, I'm not giving this up. Mm-hmm. And because of like how iconic this guitar ended up becoming in 2008, yeah. they released, Gibson released the Joan Jet Signature Melody Maker, which Amazing. had some slight differences from her model. It had, I don't know what any of this means, but <laughs> it had a single burst bucker three humbucking pickup. 
an ebony fretboard mm-hmm. and the double cutaway body in white with black vinyl pick guard. And then they also ended up releasing a black heart version of the guitar in 2010. And this one is the same, but it's all in black and it has red and pearl heart inlays, which sounds really pretty. Oh, cool. And only nine years later, in 2019, they announced and released a third signature guitar for her, which is a wine-colored ES-339. Cool. And this one they did in collaboration with her. They had two years of research and development with her and then released it. So Gibson and her are tight. <laughs> yeah, I'm like looking up the pictures of these guitars and yeah, they're, it's a nice guitar. Definitely. Yeah, they sound really pretty. <laughs> so yeah, them, that would be cool. For sure. Yeah, to be at the level where they're like, we want to make you a guitar. Make your guitars. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. Some other just facts about her at the very end. She's been a vegetarian since the late 1980s and supports animal rights. As a sports enthusiast, her music has actually been prominently featured in sporting events. Her song, Bad Reputation, was a UFC and WWE walkout song for Ronda Rousey, and she also performed it live at WrestleMania 35. Her covers and original songs have been used to promote the NCAA Women's Final Four and the ESPN cool. X Games, and she's also, of course, performed the national anthem and many significant baseball games. And her track, so cool. I Hate Myself for Loving You, was adapted for the theme for NBC Sunday Night Football, which she now performs with Carrie Underwood. Wow, I did not know <laughs> this. That's fun. I knew Dang. that Carrie Underwood was on the Sunday Night Football. That's I did true. not know mm-hmm. that Joan Jett was doing it with her. I want to go back and listen now. And then she is listed as number 87 of Rolling Stone's 100 Greatest Guitarists of All Time. In 2012, she got the Nancy Alexander Activist Award for her work on behalf of animal welfare. In 2013, she was awarded West Hollywood's Rock Legend Award, and she also got a Golden God Award in 2014. And then in 2015, (laughs) I don't don't either, but it sounds prestigious. In 2015, she was also inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I think with the Blackhearts or, yeah, Mm -hmm. I think it was with them. So yeah, that's her. She's still going. There's like performances and stuff that she's up to today. Mm-hmm. And just continuing on her way. And like I said, many acting credits as well and like producing credits. So she definitely so has a cool. lot more going on with her career. And you can go look all of that up. But <laughs> amazing. <laughs> definitely I love it. a huge mark on the rock and roll history. Ah, so cool. Okay, now I'm going to talk about Pat Benatar, our queen. Hit me with your best shot. And she does. <laughs> okay, so. Patricia May Giraldo actually is her born name. She was born January 10th, 1953. Of course, American rock singer and songwriter. In the United States, she has had two multi-platinum albums, five platinum, and 15 Billboard Top 40 singles. And she has sold over 35 million albums worldwide. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. She's also a four-time Grammy Award winner, and she was inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in November of 2022. So actually fairly recently. But she was born in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, New York City, and she became interested in theater and began voice lessons when she was still in elementary school. She actually trained as a coloratura and had plans to attend Juilliard. I don't know if it's like she got to the point that she was accepted or if that was just her goal, but she actually decided to instead pursue health education at Stony Brook University. But then at the age of 19, just one year after she was in and school there, she dropped out to marry her first husband that was her high school sweetheart named Dennis Benatar, who was in the military. He, so he was stationed in South Carolina, then they moved to Massachusetts before they eventually settled in Virginia. And she worked as a bank teller near Richmond, Virginia. And that was something that was cool learning about her life is I didn't realize that she had such like a normal beginning like yeah. she's now 20s in her 20s working as a bank teller but she actually quit her job to pursue a singing career after being inspired by Liza Minnelli's concert that she saw in Richmond and so she quits and then she just had a gig at the Holiday Inn and got a job at a singing waitress at a nightclub named the Roaring 20s so at this nightclub called the Roaring 20s she met and formed a duo with a pianist named Phil Coxon who 
pretty much then they expanded. So they were like a big lounge band called Coxon's mm. Army. And then they were a regular at a club called Sam Miller's in Virginia. They were gaining popularity. They like had a show, a special that was going to perform air on PBS, but it never did. But they were like getting traction as a big group. Dennis Benatar, though, her husband, was discharged from the army, and the couple then decided to move to New York in May of 1975 so that she could more fully pursue her singing career. She performed at an amateur night at the comedy club Catch a Rising Star in New York. She did that a lot. Her rendition of Judy Garland's Rockabye, Your Baby earned her a call back by a club owner named Rick Newman, who then became her manager. Um, and then she became a regular performer at this comedy club for the next three years. In late, though, of 1975, she actually landed the part of Zephyr in a futuristic rock musical called The Zinger that ran for a month in the Performing Arts Foundation's Playhouse in Long Island. So not necessarily like a Broadway show, but something in New York. And then between <laughs> all of these showings at this comedy club, she also would record commercial jingles for Pepsi Cola and a lot of other just regional brands. So I feel like, I don't know, she was like a working singer. She was like a middle-class working singer. Or like she is yeah. making a living doing this, but wasn't famous yet. But she headlined New York City's Tramps nightclub for over four days in spring of 1978, where her performances were heard by representatives from several record labels. And she was actually signed to Chrysalis Records by co-finder Terry Ellis the following week. Her and Dennis actually divorced shortly after, but she kept his surname, Pat Benatar. That's a great name. It is. Um, so anyways, signed to the record label, she puts out, starts putting out an album. Her debut album, in the heat of the night was released in august of 1975 and it eventually hit number 12 in the u.s march of 1980 so i guess it's just an ongoing thing album though was certified platinum in december of 1980 the following year so long stretch there was a single called if you think you know how to love me that was released but it wasn't successful but then her second single heartbreaker became more of like a sleeper hit and eventually climbed to number three in the u.s but was successful in canada and in new zealand but then comes the album that we know the most so in august 1980 she released her second album called crimes of passion that featured her signature song hit me with your best shot. It was her first single to break the top 10 and sold more than 1 million copies in the United States. And also was like a top 10 around the world. And because I think of the success of that song, the album peaked for five consecutive weeks at number two in the US. And a month later, she won her first Grammy Award for best female rock vocal performance of 1980 for the album. Um, That's amazing. That album... I know, exactly. That album remained on the U.S. album charts for 93 weeks and in the top 10 for more than six months. It was a huge success. Her third album was called Precious Time. It was another success, topped the U.S. album chart. Also, like, internationally was huge. Had some songs that did pretty well on it. Moving from 1983, her sound became a little bit more of what's called atmospheric pop. And then she released four more albums between the 80s and 2003. So she hasn't put out... a an album since 2003. She's been married to her second husband, though, was a guitarist, Neil Giraldo, since 1982, and they have two daughters. And then, like I mentioned, she was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2022. I actually want to shout out, so I found a Billboard article because mm -hmm. I wanted to learn a little bit more about her legacy. And I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs from it because I just, I loved it so much. And the whole point of the article was, the title was, Pat Benatar Deserves the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And then yeah. it, the tone of voice is just so funny. So go ahead. Give me a reason why she doesn't deserve it. Because she's not influential enough? Please. As a solo female rock pop act that dared to start her career in the late 1970s, she was sexy yet powerful, glamorous yet vulnerable. That's only the blueprint for every female artist featured on a millennial Spotify playlist right now. <laughs> and mind you, Benatar accomplished this feat in an era 
when the industry was loaded with dude rockers growing out their hair and doing blow and trying to churn out as much material as possible using sex as a metaphor in their lyrics. Madonna mm -hmm. herself was clubbing inside Danceteria when Benatar's You Better Run video premiered on MTV in 1981. It was sandwiched between the Buggles iconic Video Killed the Radio Star and Rod Stewart's She Won't Dance With Me during the network's opening moments of existence. That's not a fun pop culture footnote. That's a damn badge of honor. <laughs> which I just love that. Benatar never did have the inclination to go on American Bandstand to declare to Dick Clark that she wanted to rule the world. She preferred to empower females through her work. So you're a real tough cookie with a long history. She can withstand it and triumph from Hit Me With Your Best Shot. And then another lyric, appreciate what you have right now or else she's out the door. And then in Love Is A Battlefield, she implored young women to become strong in solidarity. These anthems weren't coming from the perspective of a teen giving herself a pep talk over a fight with a crush. She was a 26 year old divorcee who didn't have time to mess around when Heartbreaker was released in 1979. Um, I love that so much. I realized mm -hmm. recently that a lot of the rock anthems that we know every word to because we heard them on like soundtracks and the radio and everything growing up that the lyrics are so much more empowering than I ever realized. Yeah. They're so like, empowering. That's mm -hmm. amazing. Like I'm sure I, I was like subconsciously internalizing it, but it's just really cool to realize the wonderful, powerful messages that they were being able to throw in there during mm -hmm. such a misogynistic time. I know. It's so cool. Two more little paragraphs, then I'll be done. But it said, who needs a heartbreaker when you're a hit maker? Pet Benatar's true billions lies in the fact that she packaged these vital, ahead of their time themes in ridiculously catchy and radio friendly songs. She plays 15 songs on the Billboard's Hot 100 Top 40 and earns six platinum albums over the course of the decade. Her hits continue to go on in staples, both in movies, like you mentioned, and in karaoke mm -hmm. bars all over the country decades after they peak on the charts. You don't have to be an antisocial hipster still clinging to your vinyl collection to listen to Penetar's music, let alone appreciate it. And then it oh says, but gosh. it's wrong. I know. I thought that was the funniest show. Oh, I just realized I've been watching The Office recently and it brings up karaoke bars and Kelly definitely sings We Belong. Uh, Do you remember? Yep. <laughs> we belong together, Ryan. <laughs> Yes, this last, but it's wrong to discount her success just because she was a mainstream, wholesome looking pop star. Even the pop star label isn't entirely accurate. Many of Benatar's biggest hits were enhanced by Geraldo's brazen guitar. He's part of the rock and roll rock call nomination, her husband. And she also mm. won the Grammy for best female vocal for four years in a row from 1980 to 1980. Three. Yeah. So I just thought that was the coolest shout out. She actually has a memoir as well called Between a Heart and a Rock Place, which I love. What's cool is that her memoir touches on her battles with her record company and just the difficulties that her career caused in her personal life. But also she talks about feminism. And in the memoir, she's quoted saying, for every day since I was old enough to think, I've considered myself a feminist. It's empowering to watch and to know that perhaps in some way I made the hard path women have to walk just a little bit easier. So love, love that Pat so Benatar. much. What I a know. legacy. Her songs, Honestly. I have to say, I probably know the best. And it's probably because yeah. they crossed between that like pop rock sphere. Mm -hmm. And Same. I'm not obviously like a hard rock listener, but I listen to pop every day of my life. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yeah, that's how I but, as well. Um, Hold love on, that pausing. so much. The next person we get to talk about is Patti Smith. And I didn't know a ton about her, but she is so artistic and cool. Like, I learned a lot. So she is not only just an American singer. She is a songwriter, a poet, a painter, and an author. She actually has a couple of books out. And, oh, cool. of course, also her debut album, Horses, elevated her to an influential part of the New York City-based punk rock movement of the 70s. Her song that's most widely known is Because the Night, which was co-written with Bruce Springsteen, and it reached 13 on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and fifth on the UK singles. And she's been given a lot of awards. <laughs> she actually was named the commander of the Order of the Arts, of by the French Ministry of Culture. <laughs> wow. And in 2007, she was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 
And like I said, she's released quite a few books. She has the National Book Award for her memoir, Just Kids, which was a promise that she made to her former longtime partner. We'll talk about him a lot. His name's Robert. And and this was to author her autobiography. And then she's also ranked 47 on Rolling Stone Magazine's 100 Greatest Artists of All Time and also has the Polar Music Prize. So Smith was born on December 30th, 1946 in Chicago. Her mother was actually a jazz singer who turned into a waitress. And then her father was a Honeywell machinist. And she was the oldest of four children. And when she was only four, the family moved from Chicago, and then they moved to Pennsylvania, and then they finally settled in New Jersey. (laughs) So moved around a lot. And But New Jersey is primarily where she grew up. One thing that I thought was really cute is that she was very exposed to music. And her age, her mother would give her a lot of albums Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. fostered that connection with music in her. And then she also talked about the influence of poetry that was in her life. She said, I had devoted so much of my girlish daydreams to Rimbald, who is a French poet. And she was like, Rimbald was like my boyfriend. (laughs) I love that. And I thought that was so wonderful because in our fangirls episode, we talked about like how obsessed everyone was with like Lord Byron during his time Mm -hmm. and how the poets were like the rock stars of the old days. And so I thought it was cute that she had a fangirling thing for Rimbald. Totally. I love that. In 1964, she graduated from high school and began working in a factory. And three years later, at age 20, she actually gave birth to a child. I don't know anything about the father. It doesn't sound like it was a good situation. And she ended up giving her daughter up for adoption and then wow. enrolled in college. And that's all we know about that. So I'm like, out there in the world, yeah, there's someone who's – Mom is a rock star. <laughs> yeah. <have> no idea. <laughs> Crazy. But yeah, so she went to Glassboro State College, which is now Rowan University. And then she dropped out of college and moved to Manhattan, where she met Robert Maplethorpe. And she was working at a bookstore with her friend and poet Janet Hamill, and she met him, and they had an intense romantic relationship. It was very tumultuous because they were both extremely poor. And Maplethorpe apparently had some sexuality things that he was figuring out. That's as far as it goes. I'm sure her memoir about them, she's the one that, Mm -hmm. he's the one that she wrote the memoir about. I'm sure it explains more. I'm assuming maybe he was gay and trying to figure that out or bi, like Mm -hmm. not entirely sure. But she considers him to be among the most influential and important people of her life and often referred to him as the artist of her life. And what's cool, too, is he was a photographer, and all of the photographs that he took of her were eventually used as covers for her albums. Wow, that's cool. (laughs) Yeah. And they remained lifelong friends until he passed away in 1989. So they had a good relationship, despite the fact that they ended up breaking up. Mm -hmm. She actually has two books about him. (laughs) She has a book and an album called The Coral Sea which is an homage to him, and then Just Kids, which I talked about, told the story of their relationship. And then she also wrote essays for several of his books, including his posthumous book, Flowers, which she authored at his request. So they just had a very intense artistic Mm -hmm. relationship, it sounds. She went to Paris for a very brief time, like very brief, and was just busking there, like performing on the street, and then also did some performance art. And then she returned to Manhattan shortly after. During this time, she did a lot of different things. She mainly was performing in art films. She was starring in plays, She co-wrote like a one act with her then boyfriend, Sam Shepard, and then also did like public poetry performances. And she was a member of the Poetry Project. And so she, they said she just spent the early 1970s painting, writing and performing. I think that's something that like I wanted to do more this year where it's like the people who just create or just, you can just tell that they just have so much, I don't know, creative energy in them that they just give out. I feel like sometimes I like don't let myself even try something new like that because I'm like, oh, no, that's not what I do. But so I so admire people who are like so involved and it's just like clear they have so much to say. She was like truly involved in everything artistic you could be involved in. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. She also joined a band for a short time. She was like the lead singer of this little group called the Blue Oyster Cult. 
And mm-hmm. she contributed lyrics to several of their songs inspired by her poems. And she was involved at that time with Alan Lanier, who was like the keyboardist. And mm-hmm. also during these years, she was a rock music journalist who wrote periodically for Rolling Stone and Cream. Oh, wow. Like I said, okay, she was cool. just doing everything. Yeah. And it's crazy. Even because, oh, she wrote for Rolling Stone. <laughs> like, yeah. And that's just one sentence in her entire legacy. Yeah, that's incredible. So, yes. This didn't give any further explanation, but it sounded intense. She did a three and a half tour de force show to close out CBGB, which was a cool. New York City live music venue in 2006. Mm-hmm. And then she ended up teaming up with Lenny Kay, Richard Soule, and then added Ivan Kral and J.D. Daughtery on drums. And then that kind of became the Patti Smith group, which was her band. Ah, cool. Yes. So that is when her major music career started. They recorded their first single, Hey Joe slash Piss Factory. <laughs> In 1974. And later the same year, she performed I Wake Up Screaming, a poem on the whole thing started with rock and roll. Now it's out of control on an album by The Doors, Ray Masarek. That's another thing. She did a lot of spoken word poetry on their albums and like on other people's albums. A lot of like performances of spoken word poetry along with music. So very cool. And then her group began a two-month weekend set of shows at CBGB in New York City with the band Television, and then they were eventually spotted by a producer who signed them to Arista Records. Cool. So with that record company, their debut album was Horses, and it said there was some tension, but the album fused together like punk rock, spoken poetry. It has a cover of Van Morrison's Gloria. And her famous opening words are, Jesus died for somebody since, but not mine, which was an oh. excerpt for one of her poems. And those I can been- see why that would be controversial <laughs> for some people then. Yeah, yeah, but they're very famous lines. And then also the cover photograph, like I mentioned earlier, was by her first boyfriend, Maple Thorpe. And it's become one of Rock's classic images. There's a lot about her religion because she's gotten, like you said, some controversial thoughts from people about that statement. She grew Mm -hmm. up Jehovah's Witness, but left it very early on after leaving home because she found it too restrictive. But she said that like she wasn't intending to be like sacrilegious when she said this either. She was just saying that she didn't want anyone to take responsibility for her life other than her. If that makes sense. She was -hmm. was just saying, no, I'm responsible for my own sins. Don't try to take that from me. So like an interesting perspective. But it sounds like she still has like spiritual ideas and thoughts. She's just obviously not as devout as her family was growing up. Totally. (laughs) So punk rock growing in popularity. They ended up touring around the United States and Europe. While they were touring, they actually recorded their second album, Radio Ethiopia, And it was very, like, European-influenced, and so a lot of people have said it's less accessible than Mm -hmm. their original one was, so it didn't do as well and ended up with some poor reviews. But Smith still performs a lot of the songs live, and the songs have stood the test of time. It's one of those things, like, it got better with age. Yeah, like, people almost needed a couple years to maybe appreciate it for what it really was yeah it was just like really european and so people weren't ready for it yet on january 23rd 1977 while they were touring in support of their second album she danced off a high stage in tampa florida and fell 15 feet (gasps) onto a concrete orchestra pit oh that's so scary yeah Uh i was like that sounds like a worse nightmare i'm sure they have like safeguards now to make sure that doesn't happen you would hope yeah i'm like put up a net or something terrifying it broke several of her neck vertebrae it required rest and physical therapy and she said she was able to reassess re-energize and reorganize her life during this time but notably like they didn't tour Again, for a really long time after this. Yeah. Yeah. They produced two albums, like two further albums, Easter in 1978, which was their most commercially successful record, 
And then, and that includes uh, the Bruce Springsteen song. And then Wave in 1979, which was less successful, but still had a lot of commercial airplay. And then throughout most of the 1980s, she was in sabbatical, I guess you would say. Okay. Um, she mm-hmm. lived with her family in Michigan. She was semi-retired from music. I'm sure it would be really traumatizing to fall 15 feet into a concrete orchestra pit. Oh, yeah. So scary. <laughs> I don't know if I would ever go back to stage performing. <laughs> so I don't blame her. But yeah. In 1988, though, she ended up releasing another album, Dream of Life, which had a notable song, People Have the Power, which has become like a huge political anthem. And she was actually like heavily Mm -hmm. encouraged by Michael Stipe of R.E.M. and Allen Ginsberg to return to live music. They're like, come on, you got to do it. And so she ended up Mm -hmm. actually doing it and touring with Bob Dylan in 1995 and then released another album, Gone Again which included a tribute to Kurt Cobain. So she went back. Cool. Yeah, that's and incredible. Came, yeah, and came fully out of retirement. She earned Grammy nominations as she released two more albums, Peace and Noise and Gung Ho, and then also released a compilation album that had – oh, never mind. It wasn't an album. She also released a solo art exhibition oh. and then – had another show she started doing a lot of art shows i'll get into more of them later too um but she also was on the hunger games catching fire soundtrack which i didn't even realize that I that's crazy didn't know yeah i'm like so i'm cool. gonna have to go back okay. and look mm-hmm. so yeah she wrote quite a few songs continued to performance quite in many places like florence everywhere else and was contributing to a lot of tribute albums too like one for buddy holly cool. and a few others so doing a lot okay In 1979, when she was 32, she separated from her longtime partner, Alan Lanier. This is kind of relationship stuff really quickly. And then met Fred Sonic Smith, who is the former guitar player for Michigan-based rock band MC5 and Sonic's Rendezvous Band. And Patty, he adored poetry, so they had a lot in common. And they were just really dedicated to the same interests and the running joke at the time was that if she married him, she wouldn't have to change her last name because his last name was also Smith. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they ended up together. They had a son, Jackson, who actually went on to marry Meg White, who's drummer for the White Stripes, and their daughter, Jessie Paris, who is also a musician and a composer. And they stayed together until he died of a heart attack in 1994. Going back to her art. She called a lot of what she did pure photography, which was a flash-free method of capturing still objects. I'm not entirely sure what that meant, but it's yeah, cool. photography. Like, she took photos. So she did an exhibit in London for a full year, pretty much, to support the publication of a book about the Lebanon conflict. And then she also had an exhibition in Paris and then there was like a Jessica, Jessica Lang book about photographs that she also contributed to, as well wow. as many other things. Like she's done a lot of photograph exhibitions and contributed to a lot of those. She also is apparently was working on, may, might still be working on a London based detective novel that she's writing. <laughs> And also released another book in 2019 called Year of the Monkey, which a review said a captivating redemptive chronicle of a year in which Smith looked intently into the abyss. Yeah, she obviously just like art was such a huge part of her life. Poetry was such a big influence on her songs. She just continued to be a part of everything so many Mm -hmm. artists have included her as a major influence i just wrote down the names i recognized but courtney love rem the smiths u2 madonna florence and machine many more more. Um, yeah yeah a lot of european bands actually listed her as influences as well which i thought was really cool like her international appeal there is a documentary about her by steven sebring that came out in 20 2008 and also her old university, Rowan University, gave her an honorary doctorate degree for her contributions cool. to popular culture. What's ah, the awesome. point of going to college? You can just get famous enough that they give you a doctorate. Listen, is that <laughs> low-key a goal of mine? Maybe. <laughs> then you don't Maybe. have to do all the schooling. 
Yeah, true. They'd probably Maybe be willing to give you a doctor life. even more because they're like, you have a bachelor's. We'll just give you a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have yeah. one of my degrees. <laughs> yep. Like with what we've done with um, Men and Muse, it feels like it could equal I a know. dissertation sometimes. I agree, actually. Sometimes I'm like, I should have taken more art history classes. And I'm like, what's the point? They weren't talking about the women anyway. <laughs> so true i know literally i've been like man i can go back get like a master's degree in like music history and learn about men boring yeah they wouldn't talk about them we barely did and most of the time it was extra credit so true hence why we're here she actually was also on an episode of law and order criminal intent at age 64 I realized, yeah. okay, hold on. I realized that of all the cool things that she did, that got the biggest reaction from me, and I know that is wrong. <laughs> but I, I think just it's because like it's so unexpected. Random. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's like an episode of Law and Order. Like, why? Why <laughs> not? It's cool. Like, yeah. That's so cool. She was actually set to receive an International Humanities Prize, but they canceled it because of COVID. And then Gosh. she got another honorary doctorate of human letters from Columbia. And then also cool. that same year was named the Officer of the French Legion of Honor. She has been inducted. I don't know inducted- if it gets more prestigious than that. I know, right? A French award. Legion of Honor. Genuine. Just last year, she was nominated for the induction to the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she got inducted, but she was nominated. And then she also was ranked at number 117 on Rolling Stone's list of the 200 greatest singers of all time. Another thing I just wanted to mention, she is extremely politically active. There's a whole section about it on Wikipedia. She's done a lot. Like I mentioned earlier, her song Power of the People, Power to the People, became like a really big protest song. She's very anti-war. And has called out a lot of political efforts in offices, written songs about particular cool. injustices, and highly advocates for people to vote and bring the power back wow. to the people, which I think is an important message, especially in an election Absolutely. year. So we True. stand with her and your ability to go and vote. <laughs> 2024. Yeah. It is here. Ugh. I hate oh election gosh. years. So much anxiety. Yep. But yeah, that's Patty Smith, like a fascinating, Amazing. artistic, wonderful woman. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm always just, yeah, adore stories like that. But it's just, it's so clear that they're artists from the beginning to yes. everything that they do. Oh, wow. I feel like we are just basking in the stories of rock and roll royalty. And it's great. It feels good. That includes our Woman in Rock Month. It was fun to have a random themed month to start the year I next know. month isn't necessarily themed but we do also have some more fun episodes coming up super excited for this year so um i did want to do a little artist spotlight to round out the month because we haven't done please a lot do of them. to shout out the beaches who are a girl band Ooh. and their song blame brett is phenomenal ah. <laughs> and i think they're canadian but they are so good. I've been listening to them constantly. And then also you sent me The Last Dinner Party. Yep. I, as soon as you said The Beaches, I was like, okay, I got to shout out The Last Dinner Party. Yes. No, talk about The Last so Dinner Party. So cool. Yeah, that's an artist that I found recently, a band. I discovered their song, Nothing Matters. It's so good. And when I saw their band name too, I wondered if it was like a about Judy Chicago's dinner party. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was necessarily like blatantly named after it, but it was more of just a happy accident, which is the happiest accident ever. So yeah, that's another really cool band. And it's woman fronted. Yeah, I'm like loving this new girl band era. I'm here for it. Me too. I I want more. Loving it as well. Yep. So So those are two that you can check out. Mm. We like to do artist spotlights. We like to bring up people that we're listening to and loving. So yes. definitely listen to them and let us know if there's anyone that you're loving listening to right now. Absolutely. And if you are listening on YouTube, subscribe, comment, tell us, maybe comment your favorite artist that you are listening to right now. If you're not on YouTube, just rate, like review, to chat about follow. It. You know the drill. We are content creators (laughs) and we are asking you to help us continue to create content because I love doing this. So I do too. Here we go. Yeah, just subscribe, follow, rate, review, all of the regular things people ask you to do, but it really does help so much more than you guys know. (laughs) Very much. We would appreciate it. And we'll be back next month with more incredible episodes about more incredible women. We've got a stocked year. 
ahead of us. That's, so mm-hmm. we're ready to go. <laughs> Thank we you. are. We We're very July. excited about well, a lot of things coming up. Yeah. I think that's it, right? So join us. Yeah, that's it. We'll be back. Cool. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.